Pharmacy, with Dr. J.C. Matthews, where you are taught the concepts, laws and principles upon which God's kingdom operates. Now here's J.C. Okay, if you would turn with me to the book of Numbers, the book of Numbers, we're going to start at uh, chapter 20, and I'm going to read verses 2 through 12. We're concluding our series today on the anatomy of kingdom faith. And particularly, this message is entitled God's Voice in Our Words. Remember, we're talking about the anatomy of faith, and we've made a distinction between the kind of faith that we initially are introduced to when we, when we become saved. We say that there's a difference. There's a salvation paradigm faith, which is where God has uh, made the provision or access to himself available to us. So the Bible says he gives us the measure of faith. And he gives us his grace. He, he allows us through his grace access to him. And uh, the faith that we have to use for the salvation paradigm is something that has been given to us for the purpose of us receiving what God has already done. So that faith is really in a real sense, a belief in the acquisition of what you believe. So you're believing in your belief that it applies to you. And so that kind of faith is sufficient for a season. We've talked about this before. There's a transition that we'll talk about how your faith has to grow. And that's why we want to look at the anatomy of kingdom faith. The anatomy of kingdom faith. There is a quality or kind of faith that God can use to effectuate or to perform the work that he desires in the world. And the reason why he has to use a human being, we talked about this in the very beginning, uh, where God decided to partner with man. God said, let them have dominion. When he said, let them have dominion, he gave man his authority to carry out his work in this world. Dominion is sovereign authority. That authority belongs to God. He gave it to his sons over his creation to carry out his will and purposes amongst creation. So that delegation of his authority now uh, created a partnership where God retained power to himself, while at the same time, he gave man authority. Power without authority is illegal. So you may have the power to take something, but if you're not authorized to take it, it's illegal. Authority without power is impotent. So if you have the authority to do something, but you don't have nothing to back it up, then there's no use, there's no, there, there, there is no uh, benefit in having authority. If it is useless, if there's no ability to carry out what you say. And so what God has done is God is in his economy. He has retained power to himself and delegated to man his authority. And the way we access that power is through faith. There's something called faith that must be present for the power of God. The faith that we exercise authorizes the power of God in our situations. So that's a found that's a foundation. So what I want you to do is turn to Numbers chapter 20. I'm going to read verses 2 through 12. Now this is a very a very familiar passage of scripture, so many of us will be very um, familiar with the happenings, but what I want to do is take a look at some some specifics that I want to point out that will give us the um the focus that we need in order to hear and receive what God wants to say to us today. So in verse number two, it says this. Uh, this is Numbers chapter 20, verse number two. I'm going to read from the New American Standard Bible. There was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves against Moses and Aaron. The people thus contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why then have you brought the Lord, Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our beasts to die here? Why have you made us come up from Egypt to bring us in this wretched place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranate, nor is there water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron came in from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of the meeting and fell on their faces. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to them and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, take the rod and you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation. Now, listen to this. He says, and speak 
to the rock before their eyes that it may yield its water you should you shall thus bring forth water from them out of the rock for them out of the rock and let the congregation and the beast drink so Moses took the rod from before the Lord just as he commanded so there was partial obedience so he did what the Lord said he did the first part he took the rod just as God had commanded him before the Lord he took the rod from uh, the from the tent and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock just like God had told them to do and he said to them listen now you rebels shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod and water came forth abundantly and the congregation and their beasts drank but the Lord said to Moses and Aaron because you have not believed me um, the God's uh, words translation says because you did not have enough faith in what I told you because you didn't believe me to treat me as holy or to glorify me some translations say before the people so because you didn't have faith in what I said I, I didn't receive any glory although listen a miracle happened but there was a lesson there was something that God wanted to teach the people in the miracle that didn't happen. Right. Now, we're going to get into the context of this to see why that's important. Because miracles are designed to teach us not to make us dependent upon them. Right. There is a revelation in, in miracles that is to give us a, clear, a, a bigger and a clearer picture of who God is. And in many respects of who we are. So we have this situation where they didn't do what uh, God told them to do. And uh, so God brings them in verse number 12. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Wow. So so this is this this, this is a man of God that has done supernatural uh, events throughout his, his ministry, if you want to call it, through his public ministry as a prophet of God, as a man of God, as a deliverer of the people of God. And he comes to a place where God is now trying to transition the people. And for whatever reason, he was not able to make this transition. And we're going to talk about why. The Bible says in, in uh, the God's word translation, it says, because you didn't have faith in, in, uh, in my power. He has seen all types of miracles in Egypt. But I'm going to show you that there's a progression in our faith. There has to be a progression in our faith that takes place. And we're going to do this by looking at the context that how we got to the place where we're at right now. How, how we went from... Um, this man doing all of these miracles and get to a place where he his faith fails and it forfeits him being able to enjoy the promise of something that God has already provided. This is important. Something that God has already, already, already provided for him. But his faith failed in understanding how do you come into the possession of those promises? The realization of those promises. What I'm trying to say is it, 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 it is possible for you to know something is true and not recognize that in order for that truth to be realized in your life, there has to be a development or a maturation of your faith. There has to be a different mode of operation. Yes. I guess that's what I want to say. A different mode of operation. There's a, there's, there's a mode of operation at each level. And it doesn't deny the power of God is the power of God. So the magnitude of the demonstration is not a is not necessarily an indication of your maturation. It's an indicator of God's power. But we want to become not only possessors, but realizers of what it is that God is doing and, and God has done as a result of. Uh, his will being done on earth. Now watch this. I want to show you this. 
the secret to, or not secret, but the understand how Moses could get to this place. It's a subtle place. It's a place where um, he slowly but surely um, got to a place where he couldn't obey the voice of God. This is a man of God. I think that this text is a warning to the church that it is possible to confuse the means for a thing with the object itself. He had more faith in that rod than he did in the voice of God. It is possible to become so comfortable with the thing given us by God that we misunderstand and therefore misuse its purpose, which results in perversion and the frustration of that purpose. God gave Moses the rod to grow his faith with it not being uh, and, and, and he had to understand that it was not the power of God. So God gave him something to grow his faith. Moses began to associate with the thing that he gave the means with being the power of God. This misunderstanding of purpose became an obstacle to Moses's ability to actually walk by faith. Now, when we talk about you walking by faith, we're going to get into the context of how we got to the place where this happened. But we have to have some definition when you're talking about faith from a kingdom perspective. It is the ability to live by or to walk by or to act upon what God has said instead of what you actually see. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm going to say this again. Faith from a kingdom perspective is this. Your ability to walk by, act upon, and live by what God has said above and beyond what you actually see. So what am I saying? You don't need to see it for it to be so. You need to hear God say it for it to be so. And understand that it becomes so by us acting in faith. Moses failure was subtle and not a result of him having a wrong spirit. But by him having developed a habit and using what God had provided in a certain way and for a certain purpose, which caused what God had previous authorized to become unauthorized and therefore ineffective in fulfilling the purpose for which it was given. What am I saying? God, God gave Moses that rod. We we know that he authorized that rod. That rod was sanctified. It was set aside for a purpose. That's why it was set in the tent. So it was something that God gave. And, and you need to pay attention to the, the, the principle because I'm going to bring it home and talk to you about something that's more practical to something that we really, um, especially as believers in, in the church, um, have become very familiar with. And what we have become very familiar with is very powerful. It is legitimate, but it is a provision God has given us for us to become more in tune with the person and the power of God. Yes. And what the church has done in many respects is caused the thing to become the power of God. When in fact, it is a representation of and a means by which you develop your faith to realize the power of God in. And we'll, we'll, like I said, we're going to get to that place where we actually talk about that. But I want you to see how subtly th this can happen. Because I said it wasn't because Moses had pride in his heart. It wasn't because he had a haughty spirit. Uh, the Bible talks about him being the most humble man on earth. What happened was is that he became uh, over familiar with something that God had given him and it had become habitual and he was not able to transition to obeying the voice as opposed to obeying a habit which caused what God had given him to be ineffective now listen to me I know many of you are saying but the water flow from the rock that is because God's faithfulness to meeting the needs of the people. He told them, I'm going to take you to the promised land. So he's not going to send them out into the wilderness. They die of thirst. 
he he's he's not going to have that on his record. So the the faith failure happened when it didn't happen the first time because Moses didn't do it the way that God told him to do it. The second time was God simply uh, being faithful to the promise he had made to his people that he was going to provide for them and take them through this wilderness. This is some th this whole text is full of truth that we have to be discerning of or we will mistake what God did as his approval or or we will mistake God overlooking something as if uh, there was no consequences for it. God's faithfulness in spite of our failures does not constitute his approval of what we do or don't do. There are always consequences. There, there are always consequences to disobeying the word of God. Although God may be faithful in not allowing you to utterly fall through, fall through the floor, there are consequences to what to what we do that are contrary to the will of God. Now watch this. I want you to see how this rod of God became a substitute for the word of God. In a sense. Watch this. I want, I want, I want you to see this. Turn to Exodus. Exodus chapter 4 verse 17. In Exodus chapter 4 verse 17 we see a principle. Not only a principle, we, we see the authorization of God giving this provision. I'm going to keep saying this. God gave this provision to man to fulfill his purpose. This rod was a provision through which the power of God could flow. Um, if, if, if you look starting at around verse number 10, it says this. It says God told Moses that he was going to go. Moses says, I can't speak right. I'm slow of speech and I stutter. God said to him, who made your mouth? Um, am I not the one who makes the dumb or the deaf, the seeing or the blind? Um, now, therefore, go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what to say. Verse number 13, he said, oh, my Lord, sin, I pray by hand somebody else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled. Verse number 14 against Moses. And uh, he said, sin, he said, uh, and he said, is not your your brother Aaron, the Levite? He he could speak well. So I'll send him with you. Verse number 15. And you shall speak unto him and put words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his. So God was saying, listen, I know you can't talk, but I'm going to give you what to say. Now, this is key. He said, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm about to send you You're the same man who flew, who, who fled from Egypt 40 years earlier because those folks are going to kill you. I'm sending you back. To Egypt with my word in your mouth. Now watch this. Watch this. I'm not sending the army with you. I'm not sending you with lightning and uh, angels to go before you. All I'm going to do is send the same man that ran. I'm sending you back with something that's more powerful than a man who calls himself a god. Watch this. He says, and he shall be. He says, I'll teach you. Uh, I shall teach you. Let's read verse number 15. And thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and I will teach you what you shall do. Now we know putting words in your mouth, he's actually going to teach you what to say. Right. See, that this is something that we have to transition our mind. When we're speaking for God, we're speaking as God's. Right. Right. God's Speak. We, we, we do by what we say. We 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 are how spirits act is through speech. They they the way God in Genesis chapter one worked was by his him speaking. And so we see him sending him into uh, back to Egypt. He said, I'm going to put a word in your mouth and I'm going to teach you what to say. And he shall in verse number 16 and he shall be your spokesman. Unto the people and he shall be even he shall be in to you instead of a mouth and you shall be to him instead of God or, or some translation say and you shall be to Aaron God. What is he saying? He said, listen, you're going to do with Aaron what I do to you. 
And because I give you my words to say, you become a God when you say them. You giving Aaron my words to say, you will be just like me in place for him. I give you words to say on my behalf, and I'm God. He said, I want you to give Aaron the same words. And in that sense, you become a God to him. Right. Now, go down to verse number, um, yeah, verse number 17. And you shall take this rod in your hand, wherewith you shall do signs. So he has authorized this rod as a means of what? Doing signs and wonders. Heard that from the mouth of God. So when we go to go to uh, chapter seven, Exodus chapter seven, verse number 19, excuse me, uh, verse number nine, Exodus chapter seven, verse number nine. When Pharaoh shall speak. Now, this is the Lord. I'm sorry. Verse number eight. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, when Pharaoh shall speak unto you saying show a miracle for you then you shall say to Aaron take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and it shall become a serpent so what happened Aaron Moses told Aaron Aaron cast the rod down and it become a serpent right. who cast the rod down Aaron did Moses simply told Aaron what to do and Aaron did it Go down to verse number 19 of the same, the same, same text. Verse number 19. And the Lord God spoke unto Moses, saying unto Aaron, Take your rod, stretch it out, stretch out your hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon the streams. And so the first one, they cast it down and it became a serpent. This time he's telling them, he says, tell Aaron to do this, stretch out the rod and smite the uh, river and it will become blood. And guess what Aaron did? Moses told Aaron what to do. Aaron did it. He, the, rod, the rod is still, still there. So the first miracle, the rod became a serpent. The second, now the second miracle, the rod, as he smokes the river, as he stretches, stretch, stretches his hand out, the, it causes the water to become blood. Now, I know this is academic, but stay with me because this is, this, there's, some re, there's some revelation in all of this. Go to Exodus chapter 8, chapter 5, verse number 6. Chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying unto, say unto Aaron, Stretch forth your hand with the rod. There we go again. Over the streams, over the rivers, over the ponds. And cause frogs to come upon the land. You got in what? The snake. Rod turned to a snake. The rivers turned to blood. Now the same process. Stretch out your hand with the rod. Right. Tell Aaron to do it. And it becomes it makes frogs come upon the land. Right. All right. Stay, stay with me. Go down to verse number 16. Same chapter. Exodus chapter 8, verse number 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, stretch out your rod. There we go again. Smite the dust. So he smite just like he did the river, just like he did the, the other times. The dust of the land and make it become lice throughout all Egypt. And guess what Aaron did? Aaron stretched out his hand with the rod, smote the dust, and it became lice. Lice everywhere. Right. Stay with me. Stay with me. Go to, go to uh, Exodus chapter 9, verse number 23. Now, let me, let me draw something to your attention. Moses has not done any of these things yet. Right. It's Aaron. Right. So God, for a season, had Aaron performing the miracles because Moses' faith had not grown to that place yet. He saw himself as insufficient from the very beginning. God, God got angry at him and said, listen, if I said you can do it, you can do it. I made your mouth. I know you stutter. But until you come to realize who you are, I'm going to send your brother with you. 
and I'm going to give you something that you could focus your faith on. Mm -hmm. Now watch this. Exodus chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9, verse number 23. And Moses stretched forth his rod towards heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire ran along the ground. Finally, Moses has got to a place where he himself has grown in faith, where he recognizes that it is not the person, but it is the power of God that causes these things to come to pass. This, this, ought, to, this ought to make somebody shout. God was patient with the man of God that he's spoken personally to. He said, listen, I'm going to give you time to grow your faith. Experientially, I'm going to allow you to experience my goodness mm -hmm. so that you can come to the place where you can do what you're asking me to do. All right. All right. Or that you're asking pastor to do. Right. I'm going to get you to a place where you can pray for yourself. Yes. Right. I'm going to get you to a place where you can lay hands on yourself. Yes. I'm going to get you to a place where you can cast that spirit of oppression and depression off yourself. That's you don't need to call nobody else. That's right. I'm going to bring you to that place. But God is through his goodness, through his consistency in delivering you. Each one of those miracles was designed to grow Moses yeah. in right. his identity. Right. He said, listen, you got to come to a place where you recognize it's me doing it anyway. Yes. So it doesn't matter how impossible how improbable the situation is. Right. Now watch this. From that point forward, the Bible says Moses did it. Go to, go, go to, um, go to Exodus chapter 10, verse number 13. I'm going to start at verse number 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the, for the locusts that they may come upon the land of Egypt, eat the herbs of the land, even all that, all the hail they have left. Uh, verse number 13, Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt. You don't hear Aaron anywhere. Let's keep going. But, but what's the consistent fact, factor in Aaron's doing and in Moses doing? That rod. That that rod. Go go to verse number. Uh, go go to Exodus chapter fourteen, verses fifteen and sixteen. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest unto me? This is when they're at the Red Sea. They're about to part the Red Sea. Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forth. Lift up the rod. There it is again. Stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it for the children. Of, uh, children of Israel shall go through in the midst of the sea. And we know what happened. Moses stretched forth his hand with the rod. And we don't see um, uh, um, we, we see Mo, Mo, Moses obeying the voice of the Lord. We see the Red Sea part. Right. The consistent factor in all of those miracles was what? The rod that God had given as a provision. Listen, the rod worked in Aaron's hand. Now Moses is seeing this rod works in my hand. So this rod is true. God gave this rod as a provision. Listen to me. The rod did not part the Red Sea. The rod did not cause the, the blood, the, the water to become blood. The, the, the rod didn't call hail and fire from the sky. The rod didn't cause lice and frogs to come upon the land and locusts. The rod didn't do it. But it is possible for us to become confused or misunderstand because something is present that God gave us and authorized right. that we mistake it for the voice of God right. for the power of God right. so we see in this particular case listen I'm going real slow because I need for you to see this so now we get to the rock and guess what they're, they're thirsty and God tells them to do what God says strike the lift, lift your hand you, you smoke the river you smoke the land turn the blood frogs came up lights came out when you smoked it the, the, with this rod, the people are thirsty, strike the rock. And guess what? Water came out. When you look at Exodus chapter 17, verses 3 through, th three through 6. And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us? Uh, in, in the cattle, so on and so forth. 
let's go down to verse number um, five. And the Lord said unto Moses, go on before the people, take thee with the uh, take with thee the elders of Israel and the rod wherewith you shall smoke wherewith you smote the river. So he's reminding him, remember when you did that and what happened? He says, take it in your hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee in the, with the rock in Oreb, and you shall smite the rock and there shall come out water from it. And guess what he did? He smote the rock and the water came out. Now I want you to sit up with me. Now we get in Numbers chapter 20. And guess what? The people are thirsty again. And God has told him, he said, listen, now what I want you to do now, what I want you to do. I know what you used to do. I know what I said. Listen to what I'm saying. What I need for you to do now is speak to the rock. Take the rod. I, I, you know, I understand that that's like a something that 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 uh, gives you confidence. But your confidence is not in the rod. Right. Your confidence is in my voice. For the voice of God is equivalent to the presence of God. Moses goes out there. He begins to do what it is that God says to do. And instead of speaking to the rock, he strikes the rock. And the Bible says he had to strike it twice. And then water came out. And then as a result, God pulls him aside and said, listen, you didn't do what I told you to do. As a result of that, there's consequences. You frustrated. Listen, you frustrated the purpose for which I gave you the instructions to speak to the rock and not strike it. There has to come when, when you're talking about faith in the kingdom. It is it, it is it is a progressive faith where God initially provides us the initial measure. But then that faith must grow to the place where it becomes transcendent, meaning that we now do not need to see anything for our faith to be effective. This is why the Bible talks about faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen. So you're dealing with things that you don't see. But we also need to recognize, too, that when you're talking about when, 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 when you're talking about operating in the kingdom of God and God is giving you his authority to maintain his order amongst creation, there's a process or there's an order or operation or how those things happen. Now, again, God gave Moses the rod to grow his faith. I'm going to keep saying that. It may not seem like that makes much sense right now. While I keep repeating that. But when we get to the place where where I show you plainly that we're doing the same thing with something else that God has given us to grow our faith, we'll understand why there's such little manifestation in our lives and why there, there's such disorder in the world and why there seems to be no answer to what's taking place in the world. Now, let me read this. Faith in the kingdom is progressive. Uh, it's where God initially provides us the initial necessary measure of faith for one to be born again, from which our faith must mature upon this foundation onto a transcendent faith that is not that not only serves as a security of salvation, but that it empowers to operate as sons of God or God's representatives in this earth. As we mature, the things God has given us to do uh, it will take on new and greater purposes. So the things that God is the provision that God has given us, it takes on new and greater purposes. So there's an initial purpose for God giving us a certain thing. And it's for that season. That same thing will transcend and grow into uh, having a new purpose in our lives. And it will require us to transition from working with what can be seen to those things that can't be seen. Now, what happened at, in, in Numbers chapter 20 was the reason why the water didn't flow immediately was because creation was waiting for the man to do what God said. Mm -hmm. Say that. Wow. Creation knew what God told the man to do. Speak to us. Mm -hmm. So when he struck the rock with the rod, unauthorized creation just stood there. Mm -hmm said, no, listen, 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 listen to me. This is what happens when we remove the purpose from a provision that God has given us. There is there, there is a disconnect because the voice of God, the, the person behind what it is that causes the manifestation is not present. It's just us speaking or it's just us doing something. 
This is why we can't become too familiar with things that God has given us. Because they lose their purpose and therefore the power. You can become too familiar with me. God, God will send you a voice or a man or woman of God. I'm not just talking about me, I'm speaking to anybody that's listening. God will send you a gift in the form of a person with a word in their mouth. You could become so familiar with that person that the, words, that the person's uh, words no longer have any power in your life. They don't have any flow. In, in, no, it's the same person right. preaching the word of God. But because you've heard him, because you've getting a, you, you have become familiar with him or her, they no longer have the same influence or impact in your life. Wow. Say that, say that. It could be anything. Let me tell you where we're going with this. This is what the church does with the word of God. Yes. Say that. We have become so familiar with handling the word of God. We read it. We memorize it. We, we create sermons and devotions, t-shirts and banners and conferences with the word of God. And people go in and are not changed. Yes. Right. Right. Because something that God has given us as a means to grow our faith, we have placed our faith in. If I go to that conference, I'm going to be okay. No, you're not. Yes. Well, you better go there and hear the voice. Yes. You, you, you better hear God while you're there or you just wasted a bunch of money and in, in, in some days and some travel going to some place where you went. Listen, the, listen, the person there might be preaching the word of God. Yes. Preaching from the Bible. You may know the scripture that the, pe the person's preaching from. You can recite it. But if you don't recognize that that word is given as a provision to grow your faith in your ability to be led by the Spirit of God, then your life is not going to change because you have not recognized that your faith is not in, put it, listen, 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 listen to me, in the book, yes. but it's in the person that's in the book. Yes. This is a fine distinction. Listen, when you're talking about the voice and the Word of God, you cannot necessarily, from the hearing of it, separate the two. But they are two different things. Right. I've said it before. Listen, listen, listen to this example. You could hear my voice speaking and know that Pastor Matthews is here. Dr. Matthews is here. You got blindfolders on in another room. And you could hear me preaching and teaching in here. And you could say Dr. Matthews is in the house. Right. Somebody could be transcribing my words. Take them someplace else and print them and you would never know that they belong to me. That's right. They're my words, but the voice has been separated right. from the words. Right. And therefore the impact is not that I'm not present. Somebody may have another motivation or understanding of those words and say exactly what I say and it communicates something totally different. Yes. That's what we call taking something out of context. It takes on a whole life of its own. That's perversion. My words cannot, the, the voice, my voice, which is me, my words cannot do what they were assigned to do because they're not being used in the manner in which they were spoken. They're not in alignment with the voice. Yes. Mm. Listen to me. The same thing happened. Listen, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. I mentioned this before, just before we got to this place. Creation was waiting to hear the voice of God yeah. right. through the man's voice yeah. right. for it to obey him. Right. But his faith failed. Moses' faith failed. What, what, what is kingdom faith? The ability to be led and to do what God says without you having to see anything. That rod became what, he, what his faith was in. So then faith, the Bible tells us in the New Testament, faith come by hearing Hearing by the word of God. Now, what is that saying? When you're talking about faith, go with me to John chapter, because we need to define this. John chapter 5. Because the Bible says faith come by hearing, hearing the word of God. It says hearing twice. It, in that scripture, it mentions hearing twice. Do, does it not? So we need to know what hearing is. John chapter 5, verse number 19. Now, we've done this before, but for those of you who have not been 
present when we've done this or you're just joining us, you need to understand that you need to think spiritually. You need to be able to understand when the Bible talks about how God, you know, if the Bible talks about God's hands or it talks about seeing God, the Bible says no man has seen God. God is a spirit. So how can you see him? There is a equivalent, there's a natural equivalent to a spiritual reality. Things are always first in the spirit, then in the natural. So we need to un understand that when you're talking about how things work, if, if, if the Bible talks about God doing something that is seen, there is a spiritual equivalent or definition of that that we need to understand. Now, John chapter 5, verse number 19, it says this. Um, then answered Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. So that right there, you need to know, first of all, that he's talking about a process because we've seen Jesus uh, cast out devils. We've seen him heal the sick, speak the wind and waves, walk on water, um, curse fig trees, um, all these different types of things. And he says, I can do nothing. So he is telling us something that there's somebody else or something else doing it, but he's participating in it. All right. But what he sees the father do for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. So Jesus is speaking as a man here. He's saying, listen, he said, listen, my father who is God shows me or, t or, or shows me what to do. And then I do what he showed me. But God is a spirit. And so there's a translation here that we need to un understand so we can un understand what the Bible means when it says faith come by hearing and hearing the word of God. That word hearing in there must be very important. Right. Because faith comes by it and hearing the word of God is what gives you the ability to have faith. Right. It's impossible to please God without faith. Right. The just walk by faith and not by sight. We live by faith, not by what we see. So if it's impossible to please God with our faith and we must walk or live by faith, then we have to know what kingdom faith is. So let's take a look at this scripture. Let's translate the words. I'm going to start at verse number 19. Halfway through part B, the son can do nothing in and of itself, but what he sees. How do you see in the spirit? You hear. You you hear. Since spirits, you can't see them, the way you discern that a spirit is there is by you hearing it, by it speaking. So let's translate this. It says, so uh, for whatsoever things he, let's start at uh, where I started at before. The son can do nothing of himself, but what he hears the father say. The text actually says the, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. We're saying, translating that, what well, he hears the Father say. Because how do spirits act? How, how do they do things? By speaking. Listen to me, John chapter 1. God said, God said, God said. God saw what he said. Genesis chapter 2 tells us God rested from all his work. So it considers what he was doing in Genesis chapter 1 as work. Well, what was he doing in Genesis chapter 1? God said. God said, so God did everything that was done by him speaking words. So if we apply that to this scripture, the translation now gives us, us greater, un, uh, gives us a greater understanding of how we can see God and how we imitate him. Read it again. The son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees or hears the father do or say for whatsoever things he doeth, or whatsoever things the Father says, these also doeth, or also the Son also says likewise. Verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows. So how do you show somebody something? In the Spirit, you tell them. Tells him all things that he himself doeth or does. How do you do in the Spirit? You speak or you say. And he will show him or tell him greater works than these that you may marvel. I'm going to read it to you with the translation so that we in the natural can understand how we operate likewise in the spirit. It says this. 
Verse number 19. Then answer Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he hears the father say. For what things soever he hears, these also saith the son likewise. For the father loves the son and tells him all things that he himself says. And he will tell him greater works than these that you may marvel. Did you see what I just said? Mm -hmm. Yes. So hearing is what? Speaking or singing, seeing. Doing is what? Speaking. As spirit men, we see by hearing, we do by speaking. Listen to me. This is why Jesus, whenever he told them to do something supernatural, where they were going to operate in God's likeness, he said, listen, don't go lay your hands on that mountain or push it. Get you some dynamite. He said, speak to it. Yes. But listen, this is what he said. In, in Mark chapter 11, have the faith of God. Act like God does. Mm -hmm. Imitate God. Speak to it with God's voice. Yes. The same kind of faith. Faith come by hearing, hearing what? The word of God. So God is going to say something that you have a right to say. Again, let's look at that, that, that scripture now. We're talking about Romans chapter 10 verse 17. Faith come by hearing. We're talking about faith is so important. We need to know what faith is. We already have defined what hearing is, is seeing. Let's look at the text now. I know this is academic. You're going to have to sit up with me because this is going to change your life. Yes. This is going to change your life. We're, we're done with milk. We, we need to put the milk aside. Mm -hmm. We need to begin to learn how to operate like God. Some things ain't changing in our life because the word of God is simply that. It's a book. Right. It's a word of God. But we have placed our we have placed our faith in our ability to memorize what's in the book. And we haven't learned to hear and obey the voice that authorizes and that is living in the book. Yes. We need to know that the book tells us about security, but it's the spirit of God that secured us. Yes. Through the work of this work of his son, Jesus Christ, we need to know what Jesus did. But we, we need to know that the reality of what he did allowed the spirit of God to recreate us. So, so, so that act is important. What is preserved for us to learn and to meditate on to grow our faith in what has spiritually been done for us is important. But we can't replace that with the spiritual elements or the reality or the voice of God. So watch this. Here we go. Faith come by hearing, hearing the word of God. We found out in John chapter 5, verses 19 to 20, that hearing is seeing. Now that we know that faith comes by hearing or seeing, and seeing comes from the word of God. That's a strange way for Paul to state that. Faith comes by hearing. But your ability to hear comes from the Word of God. That word, word, is very important. Now, listen, faith comes by hearing. So faith comes by you seeing. The Bible talks about seeing, being able to see what God says. You can't see unless it comes through or by the word of God. Now, that word, word, is very important. That word, word, there is the word rhema. There's two types of words that you'll find. There's the Logos and the Rhema. Now, this is important. The Logos is what has been written. Right. It is the tangible representation of what has been said. The Bible, in a real sense, is Logos that contains Rhema. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. Mm -hmm. If it is it, as, as a matter of fact, let me give you the definition of logos before we go any further. Because we must be careful not to make the same mistake Moses did in his misunderstanding, misuse and mishandling of the rod of God in our understanding, handling and use of the word of God. It is possible for us to become so familiar with something that God has given us to grow our faith that we fail to understand his true purpose and the true power behind it. So the logos is given to us to grow our faith. So if you have a Bible in your hand, the printed pages, 
the book itself, the paper and ink is logos, some tangible. It's a representation of a reality. This is what I need for you to, listen, this is why you can't worship your Bible. You worship the God of the Bible. The Bible is a means given to you by God, ordered by the Holy Spirit, preserved by men who are led by the Holy Spirit, so that we would know what to have faith in. Logos. Rhema, which is the word that is in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith in my hearing, hearing the rhema of God. Rhema always refers to the spoken word. And it also, in three places, is used 73 times in the New Testament. But it is uh, three of those times, it is in reference to supernatural miracles. So this is the supernatural spoken word of God. It is, it, it is the voice of God. Rhema. Now you know why it's saying that your ability to hear or to see comes from God's voice. That's, that's how, listen to me, the, the logos is given to us to cultivate our voice. So that when we speak, we sound like God. That's why it says meditate on this word day and night. Get it on the inside of you so that you mature and develop in your likeness to God. A son sounds more like his father the more he matures. The word, the logos is given to mature you, for you to meditate on. But it has to, has to give way in a, in, a, in a sense to you using that rhema, excuse me, that logos, that word, so that you have the ability to discern the rhema of God, the voice of God. This, listen to me, this is what happened with Moses. Moses had become so accustomed to the logos, if I will, that he forgot that the logos is there to develop his ability to obey the rhema. Right, right. And so in his trying to do with the logos what needed to be done, he was not able to because he had caused the means to replace the object. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Are you listening to me? Yes. Listen to me. Therefore, you can go to seminary and get a degree and still not know the voice of God. You can, know, you can know the books of the Bible, all 66, front to back. You could have a PhD and still not know God's voice. But they will consider themselves an authority in God's word when they don't know the voice of the word. They know the logos. This is what I think is, the, is what has happened to the church. We have become so heady and high-minded and educated. Even people that don't even know what they're talking about, that's not even educated, but just know a couple of scriptures, have, have got to a place where their ability to, resuscit to, to recite and to, to repeat scripture has, has, take, has, has, has gained so much influence with people who are unlearned that they have avoided or they have overlooked the necessity of obeying the voice of God. I'm going to say it. This, 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 this is why I think the grace, uh, some aspects of the grace message is so dangerous. Yes. Because it can become that you know your rights, but you don't know God's voice because it doesn't require you to mature. You're going to have to grow to a place where you're able to be led by the Spirit of God. Now, I need, I need to move on quickly. So, so we, we, we recognize that the rod of God in the Old Testament that Moses was using can be analogized to the logos or the word of God from that perspective. It's something that's tangible that you can place your faith in, but it's used to grow your faith so that you can now be led by the reign of God. Now, the Bible says this, that creation grown for the manifestation of the sons of God. Again, creation did not obey Moses earlier because it was looking for the voice of God. Right. Romans says the exact same things. Uh, uh, same thing in Romans chapter 8 verse number 19 says creation is awaiting the manifestation or the revelation of the sons of God. We know that the sons of God are spiritual men. Yes. 
So how do you manifest? Because we know it's talking about spiritual men. Because we're, if we're talking about physical men, we're already manifesting. You can see us. There, there's no further rev revelation necessarily if you're talking about the carnal man. We are all that we're going to be naturally. But creation is saying these natural men have been born again. So, so therefore there's something more than mere men. They're sons of God. We need the sons of God to manifest themselves. How do men who are spiritual sons of God manifest themselves? The same way God did through speaking. This is why in Romans chapter 8, verse number 14, the Bible says, These are, he says, uh, these are the sons of God, those who are led by the Spirit of God. So it tells us what in, uh, uh, the creation is waiting for. Those men who are able to be led by the Spirit of God. For those are the sons of God. Let's play, let's roll it back. Ro uh, Romans chapter uh, 8, verse 14, these are the sons of God, those who are led by the Spirit of God. So the sons of God are those who have learned to be led by the spirit of God. Verse number 19, creation grows for the manifestation or the revelation of the sons of God or those who are able to be led by the spirit of God. Jesus tells us and teaches us what it's like, to, what it means to be led by the spirit of God. Go to John chapter 8, verse number uh, 26b. John chapter 8, verse 26b. I'm going someplace. He says this. For I say only what I have heard from the one who sent me, and he is completely truth. Then he goes on and says, but they still do not understand that he was talking about his father. So Jesus says what? Jesus said, I only say what I'm told to say. Go to John chapter 12, verse 49 and 50. Now I'm going to read this from the Amplified because it gives us really good Clarity on what's being said here. John chapter 12, verse 49 and 50. He said, this is because I have never spoken on my own authority or on my own accord or as self-appointed. But the father who sent me has himself given me orders concerning what to say and what to tell. This is Jesus. And I know that his commandments is means eternal life. So whatever I speak, I say exactly what my father has told me to say and in accordance with his instructions. Look at what Jesus is saying. Jesus said, this is what it means to be led by God. You say exactly what he says. Listen, this is what creation is groaning for. Those who are who have grown to a place where they are able to say exactly what God says. Go to John chapter 14, verse number 10. This is why it's important that we say what God has said. Verse number 10. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own. We just learned from the previous scripture. We know why. Because God has to tell him what to say. But my Father who lives in me does, does his work through me. So look at what Jesus said. Jesus says, by me saying what God said, God is able to do work through what I said. Did you see what I just said? This is important because there's a relationship between God's voice mm -hmm. and our words. Mm -hmm. Like we saw in the Old Testament where Moses tried to use something apart from the voice of God and it didn't work. Right. It wasn't faith. There, 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 there was no faith in it. Put it that way. Right. That, that way. You can do things that, oh goodness. You can do things that used to require faith that no longer are faith because it no longer is at the direction of the word of God. Right. Oh, what, 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 am I, what am I saying? What, there, there's something when you're talking about I'm trying to help somebody you, God told you to do something and you did it. And um, God has not said anything to you since then. So you kept doing it. God comes along and says something to you that requires another le level of faith. But you continue to do things the way you used to do, do them. And you don't do what God tells you because that seems impossible. It is no longer a act of faith right. of what you're doing. God's not involved in it anymore. Right. 
Listen to me. For you to get results, you have to, do, you have to work twice as hard, just like Moses did. But what God told you to do, it's already done. Right. He just needs for you, your faith to graduate so that you're able now to authorize what God wants to do. Right. There, there's, there's certain things that, that can't happen unless you have the faith for it. I've said this before. It's, a, it's illegal for God to give you what you don't have faith for. Right. It's illegal. So God has placed even within creation, because in Genesis chapter three, he placed a curse upon the ground. He said, listen, ground, ground is a, is a representation of the workplace. Don't give this man anything until he sweats for it. That don't take faith. You right. earn it. Right. You go to work and you work 40 hours. You already know based on your hourly wage, what you're going to get at the end of the week. That don't take faith. That right. takes work. Right. That takes toil. Right. God has opened up another economy. He said, listen, there is another way for you to get from this world what you have need of without toiling for it. But it's a different kind of work. Yes. Come on. This kind of work comes from your ability to hear my voice. Faith removes you from the toil that is necessary for you to acquire or have. Yes. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faithful. Faith is given for you to overcome this world system. Creation knows that it requires an act of faith on the individual's part in order for it to authorize God's power into the situation. Right. This is why he said, listen, Moses, I'm going to give you a rod because the stuff that you're going to do is supernatural. I need for, I'm going to give you something that by you simply using this stick, it will it, it, it will require faith for you to do it. Mm -hmm. But by you simply raising your hand with the stick. Faith becomes present and it gives access for my supernatural power in your situation. Right. Right. But when God now changes the modality by which he wants to operate and how he wants to bring. That's what God was doing. That, that, that's why he, he was saying, listen, you didn't glorify me in front of the people. My purpose was frustrated. I'm trying to move the people from the modality of things they can see to the things they don't see. Yeah. By them speaking, now they will be able to get the same results by them having to use something physical. I'm moving them away from the things that are natural so them, to them handling supernatural things. So Moses, your modality now what comes in the place of the rod is my word. I'm going to get you to a place where you're no longer going to need that rod. All you're going to need is my word in your mouth. What, what if you lost that rod in war? You in trouble. Because you have placed your faith into some. That's why. Listen. Some people can't do anything unless they have the Bible and the verse there. That Bible ought to be in your mouth and on your heart. Right. Come on. They don't know the word unless somebody turns them to the word. That's a perversion of why God gave the word. He gave you the word so he can get into your heart and into your mind and into your mouth for you to speak it. So this is what he says. He says, Jesus said this. He said, God gives me the words and I speak it, but he does the works. John chapter five, verse number 17 says this. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day. That's the new international version. God's always at work. Wait a minute. I thought God rested from his work in Genesis chapter two. The Bible tells us God finished. He rested from his work. John chapter five says God is always at work even until this day. So how is God still at work even to this day? Through our words. Jesus told you that. Right. He said, I speak the words. Then God does the work. Mm -hmm. This is important, especially when you're trying to change something in this natural world. You have to understand that your words have to be what God's words are in order for this world to obey you. Yes. Right. Creation is not going to obey the voice of a man unless that man is saying what God has said. Yes. God's voice is the thing that causes creation to move, not you just speaking words. Yes. We saw that with the, the seven sons of Sceva. They said exactly what Paul said. And the demon said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know, but who are you? We saw the same thing with Moses. Moses went out and did what he used to do, but he didn't do what God said, and creation sat there. He struck the rock creation like, and this is not authorized. 
I want to show you this principle in Ezekiel chapter 37. We see this principle throughout scripture where Jesus says, speak to the wind, speak to the mountain, speak to the mulberry tree. And each one of those occasions, and listen, if you do that and have faith, mm -hmm. faith is what your ability to do what God to do what God says instead of you having to see something. Right. He says it will obey you. Wind, waves, mountain, trees, demons. You say what God says, sickness. It creation, if, 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 if it's a creation, it is looking for the voice of God through your words. Right. But you have to say what God said in order for it to obey you. Right. Now watch this. Go to Ezekiel chapter 37, verse number 10. Let's go, uh, I'm, I'm going to start at verse number 4. Now we know that this is the dry bones. Dry bones. Everybody know the, the dry bones? Mm -hmm. Okay. He said, and again he said to me, now he saying to me is God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So who are the dry bones being instructed to listen to? Not the man, but the Lord. Now, verse number five, thus says the Lord God to these bones, look at the process. Moses, God told Moses, I'm going to put my words in your mouth and I need for you to say what I say. That's how these miracles are going to happen. You saying exactly what I told you to do, then doing what I told you to do. The rod was there as a medium of developing his faith. So his act of raising the rod was an act of faith. God can give you a word to say that's impossible. That's the act of faith. That's why Moses' faith failed when he was said to speak. There was no faith because he didn't do what God said. It used to be faith when you struck it. God says, now do this. Remember, faith is your ability to be led by the word of God, not by what you see. You can see the rod. God's trying to transition to another mod modality of operation. Right. Now you do things by faith, by you speaking what I say, mm -hmm. no matter how impossible it is. Now, verse number five, thus says the Lord God to these bones. So who's speaking to the bones? Thus says the Lord God. Ezekiel saying what God said. Surely I will cause breath. Now, this is God speaking because God is telling the man what to say. Ezekiel hasn't spoken yet. This is what God is saying to the man. Surely I will cause breath or, or, or cause uh, speaking to the bones. Surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinew on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. God is making clear. This is me speaking. But he's speaking to the man for the man to say what God just said. Now, verse number seven, watch what he said. So I prophesied as I was commanded. I said exactly what God just told me. Now, listen to me. God just spoke. But did anything happen? No. God just spoke and said, listen, this is the Lord speaking. This is what I want to happen. This is what I command to happen. Nothing moved. Why? Because God authorized man, he gave man authority in the earth. And now creation is awaiting an act of faith by this man. This man has to say something that he doesn't have the power to do. But he's the authorized medium of manifestation. So God has to use his mouth. This is why Jesus said, listen, God, I say the words, but God does the work. It got to come out of a man's mouth by authorized vessel, but I have to be authorized to say it. Verse number seven. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling. And the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, sinew and flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over. But there was no breath in them. So the man spoke and things began to happen because the man said what God has said. Right. This is faith. These are words of faith. These is this is rhema. Raymond's spoken word that the man is now speaking. Right. So therefore, it is not the man speaking. It's God speaking right. through the man. Creation hears God's voice in this man's words. Mm -hmm. So it obeys the voice, the words of the man, because the voice of God is in the man's words. Did you see what I just said? Yes. Go down to verse number nine. 
And also he said to them, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. God just said, breathe that, that these bones are going to live. This is what's going to happen. Did it happen? No. What is creation waiting for? The man to say what God just said. It's waiting for Rhema. It's, it's waiting for somebody who has grown to the place that they can operate like a son of God. That they can say what God has said. Watch this. So I prophesied as I was commanded. So this man said, I didn't add a word. I didn't say nothing else. I said exactly what God said. But when God said it to me, it, nothing happened. But when I said exactly what he said, this would happen. And breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. What does this teach us? What 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 does this whole this this whole scenario teaches about Moses? This teaches us is that we have to properly esteem and distinguish the things that God has given us to build faith from the thing that we ultimately have faith in which is the voice of God. There is the voice of God, which is the presence of God. God gives us his word so that we, we may get to know God and become like God. Word is given for us to meditate on so it cultivates within us a voice that sounds like God so that when we speak God's word, we sound like him. This is what has to happen today. If we're just simply memorizing it and because we got a good memory, we can say what is written. The voice of God is not necessarily in it because we have not received what to say from God in order to say it so that it will have the same impact. I'm trying I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say what I see. It is possible for you to memorize the verse and not have the person. And this is the danger that can become a habit. God, God will give you the word to begin the Bible, but he wants that book that he gave you to ultimately end up in you. So that you no longer need the pages in order for you to talk like God, because it has become so part of you as a result of you meditating, cultivating, confessing it, that when you speak, what's in your heart comes out. In your words, it is part of you so that now when you speak to creation, when you speak to your problems, when you speak to a situation, it's not hearing you anymore. Right. It is hearing the voice of God and it will obey you. Amen. 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 I'm going to stop right there. This has been a J.C. Matthews Ministry production. To learn more about other products and resources, visit our website at www.jcmatthews.org.